Uh, the next talk that I have for you I call Expansion Model Beekeeping. And uh, here's some, let me get this going. Come on. Uh, on, on a couple of presentations I have in the future, there'll be more of these. But if you're interested in treatment-free beekeeping and you want to participate in communities online that are into the same thing, check those out. Uh, also, I have the podcast that I produce. Uh, in the past, I've done about two episodes a month, but I'm going to be increasing that. So you'll have uh, all sorts of interviews, questions and answers. I take questions on Facebook and um, answer them on there. Uh, various guests, all the way from people who don't have bees, all the way up to expert beekeepers. Uh, I've had Michael Bush on, I've had Kirk Webster on. Um, great resource. You can go ahead and take a picture of that. I've, I'll, they'll, I have this on, on the title slide for all of them. Yes? I noticed you're recording. Are you going to have this posted on your website? Yes. This, uh, everything that I'm doing here, I'm going to be um, posting the talks on my podcast, and the video will be available on my YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash treatmentfreebeekeeping, which I don't have a link on this slide, but I have on other slides, so you'll be able to... Somebody asked a question or something you don't remember, you can just come check out the video again, you'll have the whole thing make sure it's on all right so expansion model beekeeping uh, something I was thinking about a few years back I was going to the big bee buzz conference in Tulsa that they have every spring there which I'm this year I'll be speaking at for the first time here at the end of the month a great conference um, I know the uh, organizer the guy who gets the guests his name's uh, Neil he's a great guy um, I've stayed with him at his house and he's, he's a lot of fun. Um, so I was coming over to the conference for the first time and he, he was, what he does is the day of the conference he goes to the airport and gathers up the arriving speakers and everything and uh, so I was hanging out at his house and he brought over uh, Sam Comfort. And I was talking to Sam Comfort and I was saying, I have this idea, like I think we should instead of learning, learning all the information we need to treat, um, maybe we should learn instead how to increase hives, how to multiply our hives so we can get really good at that rather than spending time learning treatments. And instead of um, trying to catch up every year we lose hives and try to catch up again the next year, what if we got ahead during the summer and then we lost a couple over the winter and we would come back around to the next spring and we'd have more or less the number that we wanted to. Because again, I, I see one of the problems that we deal with in the beekeeping community with new beekeepers is they get discouraged that first year. They, they start out and then they lose some bees, maybe all their bees, and they're trying to catch up again the next year. They're trying to restart. And that becomes a, a big um, bit of discouragement and I don't want, I don't want them to be discouraged. So instead of learning how to treat, here we do this. I should have put that up earlier. Oh well. That's what I get for putting words on slides. I should just stick with pictures. It's much easier for me to remember. Um, it also gives you the chance to multiply your local genes, uh, work with hives that you already have. One of the big troubles that I had uh, back when I was buying bees is the bees that I would buy are not acclimated to my area. So I bought, when I was in Arkansas, I lived, I, I bought bees from Georgia and they were really good bees. No complaints about that. But when it came around to winter, the Georgia bees were not accustomed to the negative zero, zero minus temperatures that we could have in, in Arkansas. And so the first time they got a good hard freeze, you know, down in the teens or single digits, um, they just starved to death on the comb. And what that happens, uh, the way that I see that normally work out is you'll have a nice big beautiful hive. These ones I had built up, started with a five frame nuke, built up to three deeps. The top two deeps were chock full of honey. The bottom deep had a nice solid cluster, you know, bigger than a football, which is a good size. Um, and there was about that much space between the cluster and the honey, and they were dead. No signs of mites, 
It's just, it's, it's what I call cold starvation. There are some people that say that doesn't exist. Bees don't do that, but I don't know of a, of a reasonable explanation other than, than that. Because I haven't had it happen to bees other than ones that are poorly acclimated to the area. So when you're working with your own bees, there are no bees that are better than your bees in your area. And by your bees, I'm including your neighbor's bees, the feral bees in your area. These bees know how to survive in your area. They know what time in the spring to start brooding, or maybe late winter, they're brooding in late winter. Uh, or maybe they don't stop brooding. They maybe just choke it down quite a bit and, and continue brooding through the fall if you have a mild winter. And that's good. They also know when to explode in the spring. Right? You'll see bees that are, that, that they'll just kind of be plugging along, plugging along, and all of a sudden they go boom, and they just massively expand. And then if, you do, if, if they're properly acclimated, a week after they massively expand, you have your first big honey flow. And they're ready for it. Those are well-adapted bees. If you're buying bees from somewhere else, they're going to be expecting to do these things based on the, the flows where they came from, not on yours. So they might expand up too quickly, and then there's no flow, and they starve to death. Or they don't expand up quickly enough, and then you get your flow, your main flow, and they're not ready to handle it, and they don't bring in much honey. Either way, it's not that good. <coughs> Sorry, that didn't work. All right, doing good. So one of the concepts that I really wanted people to understand is, so everybody has their, their goal number of hives, right? A small beekeeper might want two hives, maybe five, maybe 10. But if you go into winter with five and you want five, you chances are you're gonna lose some. 100% survival is not normal. And then the next year you're trying to catch back up to five. What happens if you go into winter with 10 and you lose, say, three? It is a lot easier to go back to five than it is to go from two to five. Do you see what I'm saying? It's a lot easier to take your weakest hive and, and squish the queen and combine it with another hive to make a strong honey building hive in the spring than it is to try and split back to get back up to the number you want. And so what that allows you to do is to not be nervous about losing your bees all the time because you know that you're going to lose some and that's okay because you got plenty. And it also allows you to uh, maximize your honey production in the spring because you're not having to worry about splitting your good big hives and you can, you can leave them alone and allow them to make honey. So... You're getting your bees from swarms, preferably. Everybody, I say everybody should be catching swarms or at least have a couple of swarm traps up so you can catch your local swarms, add to your, add to your stock. Uh, you're gonna be splitting your own, hopefully. Everybody should know how to do a split, which I'll talk about a little in this talk and then a little in, in another talk. Some easy splitting techniques. Um, and I also, it's very important in my view that people work together. Uh, depending on your local city ordinances, I, I don't know where everybody lives, but there's, I bet there's a, a good mix of people that live in, in suburbs and cities and out in the country. Um, many cities have beekeeping ordinances that limit the number of hives that you're allowed to keep on your property. Okay, so if you're only allowed to keep two hives on your property, which is a common, sometimes two, sometimes five, sometimes it's based on property size, but you want to keep more, or you want to have the resources available to you that allows you to act like you have more, then you can team up with a friend. And so if you lose your hives, you can have this gentleman's agreement that if, if I lose all my hives, then you'll give me a couple of splits next year. If, I lose, if you lose all your hives, then I'll give you a couple of splits next year. And we can combine resources and we can work together. By doing that, we create a tighter community and we help everybody succeed in beekeeping that they want to do. And I also say no southern commercial packages. I am 
really down on packages. Um, to me, packages seem to be a huge failure mode, a huge reason why people will start beekeeping and then quit. Because what happens is you're going to spend a bunch of money on uh, your hive, your setup, your starter kit, your suit, whatever else they send in the kit, hive tool, smoker, everything. And you're going to spend a hundred and however much on a package of bees. If you start with two or more, I mean, that's, that's more. When I started back in 2003, packages were $30, $35 each, depending on what queen you wanted. So it was totally different than it is now. The, the package price has inflated 300% in some places, depending on where you are. Wages have not gone up 300% in, 17, in uh, 14 years. So when you have this much money invested in these bees, we have this idea when we buy things that they should be worth it. And that's a fair, it's a fair idea. Um, but if you, if you bought a new car and it had a 45% chance of blowing up within a year, you might choose a different manufacturer, right? Um, from the, num the, the best numbers that I can get show that 45% of packages fail the first year. I've heard, I've heard higher numbers, but that's the number that I, that I know for sure based on the surveys. Um, if, you bought, if you bought a blender and you, the expectation that was in, was had, a, had a basically a flip the coin chance of it blowing up within a year, you'd pick a different brand. So why do we keep telling people to start keeping bees with packages? When there's such a high rate of failure and me wanting people to get into beekeeping and stay into beekeeping uh, even if you do succeed even if you're in the 55 percent chance that do succeed I, I have a much more holistic view of it so I just don't recommend packages at all so you can think about it you don't have to, but you can think about it like, I want to be a commercial beekeeper in five years. That was my attitude when I started, right? So when I started, um, I've decided my family motto is if it's worth doing, it's worth overdoing. So most people start with one or two or three packages. I started with 20. Uh, I was living at home at the time with my father. Um, and so I was working at a steel yard and I saved up my salary for a couple of months and I saved up, well, how much was it? 650 bucks or something and bought 20 packages. Uh, I totally overextended myself. I, I had, at the, at the height of my beekeeping at that time, I had like an average of one and a half boxes per hive. Like I didn't have enough boxes to keep them all in. And so, and also at the time, the common knowledge was you're going to lose 90% of your bees if you go treatment free. I don't feel that's the case today. If you start with, with uh, commercial packages, your loss rate's going to be pretty high. But they're not, there aren't just commercial packages available anymore. There are swarms, the feral population is healthy, and there are treatment free bees available to buy from other people so it's it's better now another thing you can do is you can start doing selective breeding the way that I do my breeding is um, I really have only three traits that I'm worried about number one survival that's just off the bat we know that if they don't survive then we can't breed from them Number two is gentleness. I want bees that are gentle. I don't like to wear gloves because they, I feel like I smash a lot of bees and I'm clumsy and it, it's just not as good. So I want to be able to keep bees without gloves. And number three, I want them to make a decent amount of honey, good production, right? So as I'm looking at my bees in the spring, figuring out which hives to split, which hives to keep, which hives to get rid of, I basically divide them into thirds, all right? I got the high performance third, I've got the average third, and I've got the low performance third. If you only want to keep a few hives, 
uh, you're not gonna you're not gonna worry about this too much but if you want to keep a few more then this is a good way to look at it and then I take um, the high performance ones and I leave them alone and use them for honey production the medium performance ones I will uh, if I split them I'll often use I'll take brood from them to make nukes and I'll give them queens that come from the high performance ones right so I'm not splitting I don't want my genetics to come from the medium performance. I want my genetics to come from the high performance. And then the low performance ones, I'm going to take, take basically just disassemble them. I'm going to, I'm going to smash the queen, throw her in a, a jar of alcohol, make swarm lure out of her, disassemble those hives, turn them into nukes, reappropriate the equipment to the hives that can use them. Right? And I like to do this uh, if my operation's running optimally. I'm doing this every year. So every year I'm, I'm breeding from the best, using the rest. Okay? Uh, a couple of tools if you want to go into rapid expansion mode. You're going to want nucleus hive boxes. You can do this with um, a simple, depending on what size box you use, I recommend running all the same boxes. It's very common to have like deep brood boxes and medium honey boxes um, or all deeps is also common and it's becoming more popular to do all mediums and then there's also the uh, the Michael Bush special which is the eight frame medium all good options I just recommend that you use all the same size because then if you need to mix and match you're not worried about putting a medium in a deep box or a deep and you can do it you can put a medium in a deep box but then you got to deal with wild comb if you put a deep you can put a deep frame into a, two medium boxes then you got to deal with wild comb on the bottom again but if you have all your boxes the same size you just mix and match and you're fine so here's a cheap five frame nuke you can find designs for this uh, all over the internet there's plenty available it's all basically the same design it uses uh, half inch plywood simple you can cut it out with a table saw or uh, a skill saw rotary saw however you want to do it you can if you want to pay for the plywood you can get cheap plywood and make them for five dollars each if you want to use uh, higher grade plywood I mean you can go all the way up uh, a lot of times you can find free used half inch plywood around it's just you know random plywood so you can do that another one that I really like and this is a, getting into a little more complex you can buy these or you can make them yourself they're called queen castles and what a queen castle is is it's a normal box a deep or a medium and it has slots cut in the end pieces of the wood so that you can stick uh, a piece of masonite or um, Luan plywood down in there and you can divide this box up into three or four mini nukes and what that allows you to do is if you find uh, your hive is ready to swarm I always recommend don't try to stop a swarm they've already decided to swarm you're not going to help anything. If you smash the queen cells, then they're going to swarm out and you're not going to have a queen at all. Um, but what you can do is you can blow that hive up and make a whole bunch more new hives out of it because they're ready to go, right? They're, they're gearing up to swarm. They're all excited. Uh, and if you take that hive all apart, and if you have a couple of queen castles, you can take one queen cell. You know, you might have... 10 or 12 queen cells in the hive you put one queen cell in a frame of brood and a frame of um, uh, stores in one of these mini nukes and you have you might you might take one hive and make it into five or ten and that's an incredibly quick way to maximize your yield and then from there they'll grow up and make new hives for you and then you can choose from the best if you have a lot of hives, you can easily choose which one's the best and which one to keep. So the ones you can buy, uh, they're available, I know, from Brushy Mountain, I think also Man Lake. Um, and I'm, sure, I'm sure more beekeeping supply places have them, but these ones I built, they're 
pretty simple, basic. I built the whole thing. Uh, you can do it with a table saw. You can you can you can build pretty much anything I build with a table saw. Uh, if you want to get a little more deep into it and make higher quality stuff quicker, you can add tools like a sliding miter saw. Uh, you can use you can add a dado blade to your table saw. You can that'll help you build some some more things. Um, and that's pretty much you, you need everything to build except for frames. You can uh, you might add if, if we can. That's not what I'm part of what I'm talking about today. But I do recommend if you want to do beekeeping cheaply and you have any skills working with your hands or you have a friend who works with their hands, you can build a lot of these things yourself and save money. It just so happens that where I am right now, um, I'm in uh, Big Wood, Oregon and we have plenty of lumber so our lumber prices are reasonably cheap I can buy boxes for cheaper than I can make them um, so I I haven't built that stuff lately but I still build my tops and my bottoms because I can make them cheaper than I can buy them here's what it looks like inside so there's just uh, this where's my mouse here we go so this sheet of Luan plywood here is is five millimeters and it's in a quarter inch slot and that divides this hive into three the mediums are typically sold as three three frame nukes and the deeps are typically sold as four two frame nukes i made all mine as three frame and then what i do with those is oh, i'll get into it here in a minute uh, and then swarm traps with a proper swarm trapping regime you don't really need to split at all you can capture swarms if you capture enough swarms you don't even have to worry about splitting you just take the best of the best you can sell the other ones give them away combine them with your other hives the swarms are absolutely excellent at drawing comb so even if the swarm doesn't survive the year if it happens to be from a, a kept hive that that can't deal with varroa they will likely build you a nice bunch of comb for the next year. You take that comb, you can make more swarm traps, you can use it in place of having your other hives draw comb. So use your resources. It's not, it's not always bad when a hive dies. When a hive dies, especially if it's, you know, in, during the year you've seen that this hive isn't really a, a good performer, then it dies during winter you've now freed up your resources to put into a good performer so uh, like like Kirk Webster says Varroa is a tool to get rid of your worst bees that's one way to think of it so I've come up with a couple of methods and we'll get into this a little bit later when I talk about other methods of splitting so I don't want to spend too much time on this because I'm gonna I'm gonna I have a whole nother talk built on how to do splitting methods, but here's one of the one of the easy ways to do it if you have either if you start with purchased nucleus hives or you're going to be splitting your hives up into nucleus hives. One of the things you can do is take one frame out of each hive. You don't even have to do it with nucleus hives. If you have a number of hives already, you can take one frame out of each hive. It doesn't take much resources or much time for them to catch that back up. In a good flow, you can draw a frame, of, a frame of comb in a day. It's really easy for the bees to catch back up if the conditions are right. And then with that, you make another hive. So you got five solid frames of brood, or you can do you know one or two of stores if you're worried about um, having enough resources. And if you have a queen that's already made or you've bought a queen you want to introduce that into your operation you put that queen in that nuke and then you have a new hive or if you have um, a bunch of nukes you can then create one nuke instead of having to split each thing in half you're just taking a little bit out of each one so each each individual hive is not suffering for the experience you make another one and then once you've done that in that hive either you've given it a queen or they've made their own queen which they can also do once that process continues then you take another frame out of out of the hives all over again and you have more and each each time you can you can increase you know if you're starting with five frame nukes 
each time you can, uh, for every five nukes you make one. After you make one a week, and after after a period of time, you then can start making two nukes. You can do so in that in that in one good solid productive year, you can go from a certain amount of hives to a whole bunch more hives. Now none of these are going to be highly productive for making honey, but at this point we're not worried about making honey, we're just worried about making bees. This one's a fun one if you like to play with swarms. Yes? Oh, so I have a question about that one. So sure. You do that, you take frames out of five different colonies, and you make a nuke. How do you prevent, and say you want them to make their own, their own queen, there's no queen there. How do you prevent them from not going back to their original colonies? Do you have to isolate that nuke somehow? The traditional practice is to move that a couple of miles away. I realize not everybody can do that, and I really haven't ever bothered. But when you have enough nurse bees, the nurse bees haven't been ever outside the hive, and they won't leave the brood. So if you shake in a few extra frames of nurse bees, there will be enough bees to, to keep it and operate it, and they won't leave because they don't know how. They'll make their queen. And they'll make a new queen. So the traditional thing when you split is you take one hive two miles away so the bees won't try to return to the old hive. But it's only the forager bees who know where the old hive is. So because the, the nurse bees, they've never been outside. They don't know how to, how to get anywhere. So if you focus on taking a good portion of the nurse bees with it, you just let the forager bees go back, you'll have enough nurse bees. And then eventually when they need forager bees, they'll become forager bees and that will be their home hive. They'll always go back to there. Okay? All right. This one's fun if you like to play with swarms. Um, and, and a lot of your hives are going to swarm anyway. All of them, if they're healthy, will probably swarm. Um, but if you want to force them to swarm, you can do that. Not super them up and, and let them... Uh, let them start swarming. You got to pay attention though because uh, you might lose the prime swarm. The original queen might leave before you catch it and so you have to pay attention to that. But if you spot swarm cells and the queen hasn't left, you can take those frames and split them out into nucleus hives or other hives and as long as you have enough brood with them and they're able to keep the hive warm or your temperatures are good for that, you can have a bunch of new hives. So that's a pretty quick way to do it. Uh, another way to do it is you take a nice strong hive, you take the queen out with a frame of brood or so, put her in a nucleus hive, and allow the original hive to raise queens. And then once they've raised queens, you then split them out into a bunch of small nukes. I like to put random acronyms on things. It doesn't mean anything. You're never going to see this anywhere else. Like, this is not going to become famous. Um, but I just like to do it. This one is, is my method and it's a little more uh, complex, but I think a second year beekeeper should be able to figure this out with a little guidance without much problem. So I, what I do is I prepare a queen right cell builder and it works like this. I take my hive and the, the great thing about this method is it's really efficient. I'm going to maximize the number of queens that I produce and the number of, of hives that I produce while still allowing the original hive to make some honey. So what I do is I put a queen excluder in. Shows a queen excluder already in there. I don't normally use queen excluders, but I'm gonna put one in, make sure the queen is in the bottom. I'm gonna put an empty frame of comb down there. When I set all this up, I'm gonna take some brood. I'm gonna put them, you can, you can see how these are. These dummies are just boxes that you can build out of scrap pieces of wood and you can I don't know, I need to set up a page on my site that shows how to make those because people, people wonder how to make those. But you just measure a frame and create a box that's the size of, of several frames put together. It's, it's that simple. Um, you set it up this way and then in a couple of, in four or five days you come back and the queen will have laid up that that frame of comb with eggs and those eggs will be hatched out and they'll be day-old larvae or some of them will have 
the, the oldest ones. And then from there you can graft. Grafting is not hard. You should not be scared of it. For so many years, when I, after I started beekeeping, I didn't graft until, what, 2011? So about eight or nine years, I didn't graft because I thought, oh, grafting's hard, grafting's terrible. But if you go online on, uh, on YouTube, you can find this um, queen production videos from Argentina, and there's this 12-year-old girl and she's grafting. She's the fastest grafting person I've ever seen. She's doing one every f four seconds, like that quick, like one in place, just like that quick, just like she's spooning Cheerios or something. <laughs> and I thought, well, if this 12-year-old girl can do that, certainly I, as an educated adult male, can figure out how to do this. And so I did, and I bought a couple of grafting tools to no test privilege. out. Yeah, no <laughs> problem. <laughs> Um, so it's really, it's really easy, and um, if you mess it up, what have you lost? You've lost a couple of bees, right? You, you've, you've killed more on your, on your windshield on the way to your bee yard than you did, than you've, you've hurt here. Um, so you can graft. You place the, uh, the grafted cell in here. Um, put fresh brood up in there again. You can find this all on my website. A big, huge write-up. I'm just going to give you like the the 30,000 foot view right here. If you want the details on actually how to do it, go to my website on the queen rearing page and it will tell you in great detail the whole process. So I'm just giving you a quick rundown here. Um, after the correct amount of time, uh, start yourself a, uh, a calendar. So you can either find out how many days you need to grow a queen and you mark it down on your calendar or like I do, I have a, uh, I'm an engineer so I have a spreadsheet and I put in the date that I graft and I can do it ahead of time. I can put the date in the graft and it'll tell me what I should do in the days leading up to it so I'm ready. And you can download that from my website. And it'll give you a couple of different views so it has a, uh, it has my, what I do, it has Michael Bush's queen rearing schedule. Uh, things can be different based on the temperature, so you can pay attention to that. But it'll tell you everything to do and you'll be ready to go. So when it's time, I take the, the queen cells out of the hive. Now, my best, the best that I've ever done is 28 queen cells out of one batch. Um, if you have something happen like it snows while you have queen cells in the hive, they're probably not going to turn out. I had that happen in Arkansas. It snowed on like May 15th. You know, and I start raising queens back in March, so what are you going to do? You take those queen cells, you take a frame of brood and a frame of stores, or if you, if you want to help, you can add uh, two frames of brood and a frame of stores in one of those queen castles or a five frame nuke, however you want to do it. Whatever you want to do, you want to make sure that the hive is big enough to keep that queen cell warm, right, proper temperature. Around here, your, uh, your springs are a bit more warm and humid than mine, so you might not need as many frames of brood. Uh, in Arkansas, I only needed a frame of stores and a frame of brood. In Oregon, I need two frames of brood because it's a bit colder at night. And then from there, the queens, that, that queen castle now becomes a mating nuke. Those queens are going to hatch out. They're going to go out and fly and do their, uh, their mating flight. They're going to come back and they're going to start laying. If you use mini mating nukes like it's common to use in the commercial world, those nukes will be laid up so quickly that the queen will have to shut down laying. And that's why a lot of times you get poor quality queens from commercial queen rears. The, the box is not big enough, you know, it's usually only the size of a big cereal bowl. It's not big enough to allow the queen the proper time to develop and lay eggs. You'll see an early queen, a new queen, will often lay multiple eggs in a cell, uh, which, which you can mistake for a, laying, a, a queenless colony, a laying worker colony. Uh, a new queen will, will lay spotty brood pattern. Uh, they'll do all sorts of things. They're brand new at it. They don't know what they're doing. 
if you don't have a big enough hive to allow that to work itself out, you won't know if the queen is properly mated. So commercial beekeepers, they just pull the queen out, throw her in a cage, and put a new queen cell in, and they just repeat the process over and over again. So you, they, they don't know if even the queen is properly mated because they don't check. But with a bigger queen castle, with the with the bigger combs, the other thing is you have, these are full full size combs, like deeps or mediums, however you want to do it. So you don't have to worry about having this extra small size comb that doesn't fit anywhere. What do you do with it at the end of the year? You know, having to store it and everything. So you don't have to worry about that. The queens that don't make it back from the mating flight, maybe she got eaten by a dragonfly or a bird or something, um, you then can combine two of these three frame nukes, one that the queen didn't come back, combine it, now you have a five frame nuke and one extra frame to put somewhere else. All right, so now you have a five frame nuke, and as the process comes down, you find maybe a couple of queens didn't mate properly and they're not laying properly, or they never mated at all and they're not laying at all, you can combine some more, now you have 10 frame hives, and out of a batch of a certain number of queens and nukes, you now can come up with, by the end of the year, several full-size hives out of this huge collection. So, one second. It's, um, it's all about getting it out there and then bringing it back together, rather than having what you want and trying to catch up when you've lost some of it. You kind of get that idea? It's, it's changing your mindset from, from doing this set thing and then trying to get it back when you've lost it. Instead, you're doing this big thing, knowing that you have this core that you're wanting to keep. Practically speaking, you're getting into this production colony like once a week or less than that. This one, you'll be getting into, you'll get in there to do the initial setup. You'll get in there on grafting day. And then you'll get in there to take the queens out on day 10. And that's pretty much it. You can re-up it and put a new batch of queen cells in. Because this, the way this works is because you, you have a queen right hive, basically you're, you're kind of you're kind of tricking them into doing a supersedure and then taking the queens out before they can do it. Because the theory is the theory is when the queen walks around on the comb, she leaves pheromone behind. And if uh, she doesn't walk around on the comb, then the bees start to start to believe that she's not laying everywhere, that, she, she, that she's losing her virility. So when you keep this section of brood up here without her, and you introduce queen cells in there. See, bees don't, don't tell each other, by the way, we're building a queen today. One bee comes along and sees what the other bee has done and they do it together. So when you build, when you put queen cells in there, they think, oh, we've started raising queens. And they check around, there's no queen pheromone, so it must be time to supersede the queen. And so you're tricking them into a supersedure and you can do that over and over and over again and keep that process going. So you can make as many queens as you want. This process doesn't make a huge number of queens like the, the commercial, beekeepers do, but you don't need that, right? You're maybe raising a few for yourself and some for your friends, um, maybe selling a few, however you want to do it. You can make it as big or small as you want. Do I have any more? Yes. Uh, again, packages aren't, aren't working for us, so let's try and get away from them. Uh, focus on your local bees, splitting your bees or getting splits from your friends. You can work as, work as a team, you can work together as a mini cooperative, or you can buy stuff from each other and just uh, run your own little businesses. Questions? Yes. You said the store, storage frames. What do you, is it just honey? Or yeah, honey or pollen. Or both would be preferable. You can do one of each. Uh, most brood frames have some pollen on them and some honey. So if you don't have a laying queen, you're not going to need all of that pollen immediately. Um, so the honey is more important, though, because they need that as fuel for heat. Yes? 
when you're raising your own queen, particularly if you're in a place that you might be the only beekeeper within several miles, what are the chances that your queens are going to come back and maybe? I believe, um, I've heard people are often concerned about the um, genetic variability but I have rarely ever found that to be a problem. The only cases where I've ever found where queens are not getting mated or bees are getting inbred, well, the inbred problem is a, more, it's a bigger problem, and that's where some commercial beekeeper owns thousands of hives in one area, and he breeds from his own queens and mates back to his own bees. And that can become a problem fairly quickly. Uh, other cases, when when a queen's not getting mated, it's usually because of some weather conditions. There are usually plenty of drones around. They fly for miles and miles. Um, Michael Bush tells me that, that drones basically fly themselves till they're exhausted. Like, everybody thinks that they're lazy and they just loaf around the hive, but they're actually doing a lot of hard work and they get one quick reward and then the whole show's over. What's the likelihood of your queen with your own drones? Brothers. Very unlikely. unlikely. Yes. And because she mates with so many drones, even if that does happen, you know, there's still, you know, if she mates with, let's just say 10 for easy round numbers, 90% of the, the bees are, uh, the workers are going to be fine. 10% are going to be a little inbred. But unless that happens several generations in a row, Inbreeding, inbreeding usually doesn't become a problem. Bees are very good at spreading it out. Yes? Um, let's say you've got two hives coming in the spring, but you do want to make some, not just splits, but you would like to split. Mm -hmm. How many frames would you typically take from a hive and still not really affect their ability to be productive? <laughs> Assuming always the honey flow or nectar flow. On the short term, you're not going to cause a whole lot of problem. Where you're going to cause problem is uh, a few weeks down the row when you now have a portion of your work or your flying force is missing because you've taken that brood and put it in another hive. So uh, one way you can do that, and I'll talk about this here in a little bit in another talk, is when you do a uh, just a straight half and half split and the queen stays with the new split, and the old one stays in the same spot and all the workers, the flying force, the foragers come back to that one. While they're busy making a new queen and they're not having to feed as much brood, they can bring in a whole lot of honey in that time. And so you can produce a bumper crop on that hive. So there, there's a few methods to get around that. Anybody else? Yes. How do you decide how early in the uh, spring you can start queen rearing? So it's the, such that there will be adequate drones around to... That totally depends on your conditions. Uh, so you just look at the, the frames and you say, ah, they're starting to raise drones, I can start queen rearing? Or? I don't think you want to do it quite yet. The, the typical rule of thumb is when drones start flying. So when the first drones start flying, you start your queen rearing process then, if it's warm enough, depends on your conditions. And if by the time you have queens ready to mate, it's going to be several weeks later and you'll have more drones flying and so it'll be, everything will be fine then. Anybody else? All right, well, uh, let's take another just five minute break. I'm drinking a lot of tea here, so I'm going to have to take some breaks. And we'll be back and we will talk about swarm trapping.